It's the gospel that Galatians is about. Why don't you turn there? Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. For each one should carry his own load. Anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. So if you still have your Bibles open there, look at that last verse of chapter 5. It says, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So these, these chapters and verses, they were not in the, the original text here. This is what we put in later. This verse, this last verse of chapter 5 is actually what, what guides the rest of it here. It's about being conceited. Or avoiding being conceited. So that conceited, another translation of that word might be vainglorious. Literally to be empty of glory. To have some sort of glory, but it's just a shell of glory. Not really of any substance there. Nothing really to brag about. Something that people gloat about, but is nothing really to gloat about at all. Now all of us need recognition, and appreciation. We all need that. But the way to receive it is not the way that we naturally look for it or want it. In our human nature, we want the glory. We don't want just recognition and appreciation. In our sinful nature, we want the glory. We want, we want the thanks, we want the credit, we want the praise. So, in psychology, there's all these experiments that they do with, with people on, on this sort of thing. There's actually a whole name for it. It's called self-serving bias. So, for example, we will accept credit for success. We will blame others or circumstances for failure. We don't, that's not our fault, it's somebody else's fault. If there's a test or some other source of information, even something like a horoscope, that flatters us, we believe it, and then we evaluate positively both the test and any evidence suggesting the test is valid, no matter how random it may be. In explaining victories, athletes, they will commonly credit themselves when they win, but losses, they attribute that to something else. Bad breaks or bad ref call or Maybe the other team's super effort or maybe dirty play. So 
when there's success, when there's something to take credit for, in our human nature, we want to take that credit. That, hey, that was me that did that great thing. And if there's failure, oh, that wasn't me. That was somebody else. Or it's bad luck. In wanting glory, we use others to feel good about ourselves. There's so many examples on social media about this. Social media, is a lot of it is just taking, taking glory for ourselves. I mean, even just the pictures that we have as our profile pictures, those aren't our least flattering or even moderately flattering pictures. They're, they're our best pictures, aren't they? We, we don't post about our failures. We post about something that we succeeded at, right? This is, this is the way we operate, and I'm not exempt. We, we want to put forth our best foot. We want to look good. We want to feel good about ourselves by the recognition of others. Apparently in Galatia here, they had some similar things going on. People were looking down on those with terrible circumstances, and they thought themselves something when they were nothing by comparing themselves to other people. When you compare yourself to somebody else, that's a way to feel good about yourself. Hey, I'm a little better off than they are. I'm, I have more money than they do. Maybe I'm better dressed than they are. I'm more educated than they are. I'm, I'm smarter than they are. I'm better at this than they are. And when we compare ourselves to somebody else, we try to use that to feel good about ourselves. But this is not the way to go. 500 years ago, when Martin Luther nailed those theses to the church, if I was preaching at a church at that time, I would be telling you that salvation is dispensed by the church. That it's we who give you salvation. You would get pardon from sins by indulgences, you would get forgiveness by confession to a priest, to me. And you would receive righteousness by doing penance. And as the dispenser of salvation, the church was very powerful at that time. And so a lot of people who were interested in being powerful, they were attracted to church offices. So being priests and being bishops and so forth and being the Pope. And so... A lot of hungry despots who wanted power were in those positions at that time. And offices of the church were being sold to the highest bidder. I came across this Catholic magazine article that was actually talking about the errors of the Reformation. But it said this, Even the hardiest Catholic apologist now concedes that initially at least, Luther and his followers were reacting against real abuses and excesses in popular Catholic beliefs and practices of the time. There was a lot of wrong stuff going on. And there was a, there was a bishop, Robert Barron, who wrote this. When the primacy of grace is forgotten, myriad problems ensue. Luther saw this danger in the life of the church, and so he cried out with true prophetic vigor, on behalf of grace. For this witness, the entire Christian family owes Martin Luther an enormous debt of gratitude. And he goes on to say that he went too far. But there were some bad things going on at that time. And to summarize what we learned at that time from those experiences, we are saved by grace alone, in Christ alone, through faith alone, according to Scripture alone. When we tend to get off track, we tend to go back to the basics. And these were the basics. Saved by grace alone, in Christ alone, through faith alone, according to Scripture alone. And Galatians hits all of these. Salvation is by grace then we have nothing to prove. We have nobody to impress. 
And we have every reason to be humbled in ourselves and to honor God. Our salvation from beginning to end is an act of God's grace, and therefore, all glory is God's. And so, there's one thing that's missing from this right here, and that's sola deo gloria, glory to God alone. If we are saved, as we are, by grace, then all glory is to God. We have nothing that we can take credit for. We have nothing that we can hold and say, look at what I have done. If God has saved us from beginning to end, then all glory goes to God. Glory to God alone. Let's look at the screen here and let's answer this together. What does your conclusion to this Lord's Prayer mean? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever means... We have made all these requests of you because as our all-powerful King, you not only want to, but are able to give us all that is good. And because your holy name and not we ourselves should receive all the praise forever. So God gives us all that is good so that he would receive all of the praise. Did you notice verse 11 when we were reading our passage today? See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Galatians is, is an angry letter. The gospel is being compromised and the people of Galatia that Paul witnessed to and told the gospel to, they're being led astray into a false gospel. And so his anger peaks at different parts here. And so right here, he's writing with his own hand, and he has to call attention to that. Back then, most letters were dictated to a scribe, and so it's pretty easy to imagine here that Paul was dictating this letter to a scribe until this part. So it's almost like he's saying, he's dictating this letter, or give me the pen. See what large letters I write to you with my own hand. This is serious. Pay attention here. So, they didn't have fonts back then, but he would have picked the most aggressive font. He would have put it in bold. He would have underlined it and italicized it. Pay attention here. So this last part of Galatians is where this whole book comes together. See what large letters I use. This is important. So, he's warning them about these people that are leading them astray. And those saying you must be circumcised to be saved, there's four things about these people that he points out at the end here. Verse 12, they're trying to impress other people. They're trying to make a good impression outwardly. We're trying to impress other people here. This is what they want. They're looking at appearances. What's on the outside? Forget about what's on the inside and the heart. This is all they care about. Appearances. Good appearance in the flesh. They're trying to impress other people. Number two, they're wanting to avoid persecution. At this time, tensions between Jews and Romans were escalating. And so to be Jewish, if you were Jewish, being compelled to be circumcised was very important because your Jewish identity was kind of bound in that. And if you were going to be Jewish, you had to do that. And Christianity was, and there was many Jews who were Christians, and so there were a lot of Jews who were mixing the political ideology of the time, resistance towards Rome, with the gospel message. And so they were putting that together. You must be circumcised to be saved. And so they would persecute people or pressure them if they weren't circumcised. You have to do this. Number three, they themselves do not keep the law. It's not the law that these people are actually concerned about. They're telling you that you have to. They're telling you that it's in the law. But it's not really that they care about the law at all. I mean, earlier he talks about how none of us can actually keep the whole law. 
That's impossible. We're, we're sinful human beings. We can't keep the whole law. Only Christ has done that. And they're not concerned about the law, but they're telling you that you have to keep it, at least just this one part of it. Picking and choosing. And four, they're looking to boast in their numbers. Look at how many people we have circumcised. So these people may have been from Jerusalem, for example, and then they can go back and say, hey, we got this many circumcisions from our going around and teaching. And Paul's point throughout this whole letter is that Jesus is the opposite of all four of these things. He's the opposite of this. This is not what he is about at all. Jesus was not about trying to impress others at all. He really didn't care what other people thought about him. He would tell the truth, even if it made him very unpopular. He wasn't avoiding persecution. He submitted himself to it willingly. He didn't even speak in his own defense at his own trial when he had a lot to defend himself about. He was the only one who kept the law. And he wasn't boasting in any numbers. At the end, he had nobody. All of his disciples deserted him, it says. He was the opposite of all four. This is not Christ. Then there's verse 14. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Christians have no boast except what Christ did on the cross. We have nothing to boast about at all. May I never, where he says that there, he's using very strong words. Almost like a heaven forbid kind of an expression. Just he shudders at the thought that of boasting in anything else besides what Christ already has done. Heaven forbid we should boast about anything else. They were boasting in circumcision, these, these people, these agitators. When it comes to salvation, we have no boast at all. We have no boast at all. My dad was one time debating somebody who was saying, you know, you need to do these certain things to be saved. You need to, you know, do these things that the Bible commands. You have to. And my, my dad says, well, on that last day when I stand before God, I'm going to have empty hands. I'm, I'm going to have nothing. I'm going to say, Lord, it's only by the blood of Jesus that I can stand before you and enter into eternal life. And the, the guy's response was, well, maybe, maybe I'm carrying a little something. As soon as you do that, you lose grace. It's not by grace anymore. We have no one to thank but God through Christ. And this was even foreshadowed in Jeremiah in the Old Testament. This is what the Lord says, Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, Or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. So as the song says, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. The cross, it's very strange. Very strange, especially for people at that time to say, I would boast in the cross. The cross is the most painful, shameful, disgusting symbol known to man. Particularly for people at that time, this was an object of horror and disgust and revulsion. It's designed to be that way. Rome would crucify people as a warning to others to horrify them into submission. And they succeeded quite well. 
you didn't even mention the cross in polite company because it was just so awful. They would crucify victims on hills and busy street corners so that as many people as possible would see it. So you saw it. If you mention a crucifixion, you knew exactly what that was because you've seen it before. And when you saw it, you would never forget it because it was just so awful to look at. Victims were either nailed or tied or both. They would spend days in agony on those crosses. It would be a terribly gory sight to see. And sometimes their bodies were just left on there for wild animals and birds and just decay to take over. It was disgusting. It was horrifying. And now Paul is saying, may I never boast except in the cross. What? That, that doesn't make any sense. That Christians would boast in the cross means an upside-down view of everything the world says is important. Everything that our world says is important, to say that we are going to boast in the cross it's saying we're going to boast in everything opposite of that. It means an upside-down world. This is, this is madness, really, people. This is, this is weird. This is strange. This is, this, this is insanity by the world's standards. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 1, 22-24, Paul says, Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks, or Gentiles, look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. To everybody else, this is nonsense. This is revolting. To believers, this is everything. This is our only boast. One of, the, uh, one of the more talented preachers out there right now is named Tim Keller. Maybe you've read his books. Maybe you've heard of him. I've mentioned him here before a couple times. I was listening to him give a, a message on this very passage. And so if you see that, I did borrow a few ideas from him to give full credit where it's due. But as I was listening to this message, I was thinking, wow, this guy is so great. He's... He, Look at all the ways he's quoting all of these, these different sources. He was quoting Shakespeare and Ghostbusters in the same sentence. He was, it's popular culture and high culture. This, this, this guy was an amazing speaker. And I was just thinking, wow, boy, I wish I could preach like that. And right when I was thinking that, he says this. A lot of people say to me, I'd love to preach like you. And I say, why? What do you mean? And they say, well, you quote so many great books. And I don't know how you read so much. I wish I, should, I could quote as many great books as you. And he says, okay, look, I've got a good memory. And I want you to know that it's no virtue at all. I didn't cultivate it. It's not a fruit of the Spirit. I got a good memory. That's great. I sound smart. He's got this sarcastic voice. If anything, I have to watch about that. I have to be careful that I don't believe all the good things people say about me. But that's not boasting in the cross. That's boasting in how much you've read. It's boasting in your end notes and footnotes. It's boasting in how much I know. So, is there is that moment where I got it. See, even something like this. Boasting in the wrong things. So I was looking at this guy and saying, wow, I wish I could be like that. And he's telling me, why don't you look at Christ? And why don't you say, I wish I could be like that? Christ on the cross, even. That's when this clicked for me. He says, the world has been crucified to me there. That means Christians are dead to the rat race of recognition. This is a rat race of trying to be recognized, trying to get glory, trying to get people to see 
what we've done so that we can feel good about ourselves. People wear themselves out for ribbons and medals, titles, trophies. And for many people, failure is not just discouraging, it's devastating. Because their identity and their dignity rest on certain kinds of success. Without need for recognition, let's say if you took that away, we don't need to be recognized because we're saved by grace and we're walking in the footsteps of Christ. If we don't need that, then our efforts are liberated to help carry others' burdens, like he said. Carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. That's what he did. He came here to carry our burden of sin that we could not lift. And then our efforts are liberated. We are free to give to those who cannot repay us. We are free to love those who won't love us back. And we are free to make sacrifices without being recognized. Everyone has a load, but some people have unbearable burdens. Maybe you caught that in the text too. He says everyone should carry his own load, and then he says, but we should bear each other's burdens. We all have loads that we carry. We all have our baggage, as we say. But there are some people who have loads, people who are crushed by different things. Some people fall into terrible circumstances. We've seen this a lot in our country recently with all of the hurricanes that have been hitting recently. These are people who are bearing loads that might crush them. There's also earthquakes and fires. Some people fall into bad habits. Just this week, our president announced a, an opioid crisis. There's a lot of people who get sucked into this without intending to even. And there's loads to carry. But if we don't care about having the latest and greatest, for example, which most of the world does, then why not give much? Why not share all the more? If we don't care about being with the best and the brightest and standing next to the coolest people all the time, then we can talk to the lonely people. We can talk to these, those who are awkward. If we don't need to succeed then we can give all this extra time to be like Christ, to serve one another, to help people who might not otherwise get helped. And if we don't need to hear how great we are, we can be a listening ear to the pain of others. If you need to hear how great you are from other people, you're not going to have a lot of time or much of an ear for anybody else. But there's a lot of people out there who the greatest gift that you can give to them is just sitting and listening. Because nobody else wants to listen. When all boasting is in the cross, we will sacrifice ourselves to show Christ's love. That's what he's talking about. Let's be like Christ. Let's boast in that. Let's boast in the things that are the opposite of everything that this world wants and seeks. Let's boast in what Christ accomplished on the cross. And let's free ourselves from vain glory. Boast in the cross. All glory be to God alone. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God, you've saved us. By your grace, we are very grateful to you. Lord, we want to give you the glory. We want to give you the recognition and the thanks that you deserve. And for ourselves, we want to boast only in the cross. We want to be free from this rat race of recognition. And we want to seek you. And we want to value the things that you value. Give us eyes to see the world as you see it. Upside down even from where, the way the world sees it. And Lord, may you receive all the glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen.